In the movie Top Gun Maverick, Tom Cruise plays an air combat instructor who is unbeatable. He's just so good that none of his student pilots have a chance against them. They go into simulated combat, he's on their six and shoots them down. Nobody has a chance. It sounds like pure Hollywood fiction, but that character is actually based on a real guy, a air combat instructor from the 1950s named John Boyd. Boyd went on to become a legendary figure in the armed forces of the United States, not because of his air combat skill, but because he turned that skill into an entire conception of strategy that he called the OODA loop. We're going to be talking about that today. This idea of strategic vision is really important to understanding how MA370 might have happened and what we can do about it. Hi, everybody. Jeff Wise back with you. Today, we're going to be talking with an old friend of the podcast, Tom Withington of the Royal United Services Institute, who is an expert in electronic warfare and cybersecurity, and also just published a really interesting paper about maneuver warfare, which John Boyd's ideas have really been formative in shaping. And stick around after the interview, because I've got news for you about the Flapron project and feedback about the mysterious world of UFO wormholes. A couple of housekeeping things first. For a long time now, we've been offering paid subscriptions on the Substack show page. I've been so busy making the podcast that I haven't had time to offer additional features that might, you know, reward people for doing it. The people who have been taking paid subscriptions have basically just been doing it out of the goodness of their heart. I've been really wanting to offer something and people who are new to the podcast might not know that it started out originally as a collaboration last year with a journalist from Milwaukee named Andy Tarnoff. We did 31 episodes together. Those are now under his control. I don't have access to that original YouTube page anymore. I do have the videos and when we made them, we were still figuring out how to do it. And I thought it might add some value if I remastered them, re-edited them, add some new content and made them available to the public so that they could familiarize themselves with the kind of information that's the underpinning of the current podcast. And I also want people to have access to it. So to kind of square the circle, what I've decided to do is for paid subscribers to the Substack show page, I will put up these original remastered episodes behind a paywall, only they can have access to it. But then after a week, I will take it and put it on YouTube so that everyone can see it. Let me know if you think this is a good idea, if you are a paid member, if you think this is a worthwhile, something to get for your money. Uh, if you're not a paid subscriber, maybe let me know if this is something that might induce you uh, to become a paid member. I basically, feel that anyone who is giving money to help support this podcast is really doing me an incredible service and help. And I am, I am grateful to you. Anything you can do to help is, is incredibly uh, worthwhile. And if you don't, uh, if you don't feel like you can join a paid membership, just even subscribing to the Substack show page or subscribing to the YouTube channel, that helps me enormously too. Enough of that. Let's get on with the interview. Tom, I really appreciate you coming back on again. You are the first person I've had on twice. So that's quite a historic Aww. moment here. I just, <laughs> you, what you are concerned about and what you, what you study is of so direct relevance to this topic. So thank you for coming on again. Well, thank you for the invitation, Jeff. I mean, I really enjoyed the chat we had last time and it, it's very flattering to be back uh, and chatting to you once again. And I'm sure we're going to have um, some more fun delving into to some of these weird, wonderful subjects that we we sort of touched on last time and we'll be tackling today. Yeah. So for um, listeners and viewers, uh, Tom was on episode seven, which was the threat space, which had to do with cyber warfare and the vulnerability of civil aviation to cyber attacks. Uh, today, um, I was quite fascinated to read your paper, which was called Maneuver Warfare and the Electromagnetic Spectrum, which appeared in the uh, RUSI Journal, because you are a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. And this was a topic that you took on. And, and I really wanted to address it because to understand 
this event, which may have been a strategic level action, we need to understand the strategic environment that existed and the strategic thinking that is now common amongst, I would say, armed forces around the world. This is idea of maneuver warfare. And I was hoping you could kind of talk about basically what is maneuver warfare? Many ways, it's many things to many people, but mm -hmm. broadly speaking, I think how you can summarize it is that it's a desire to degrade the enemy's will to fight, so to continue the battle, continue the war, with the minimum expenditure of force necessary. So how I would sort of characterize this is you think about the sort of thing that we... Uh, hear about from the First World War, uh, particularly the latter stages of the First World War where, uh, in Europe, where the war had become very attritional. And what that meant is you've effectively got two evens, evenly sized forces thereabouts facing each other, slugging it out. How maneuver warfare differs is it's an attempt to try and find the weak points of an enemy, but weak points where their loss or their degradation will cause a significant problem for that enemy, possibly even precipitating their defeat. Um, it's not a new concept. I mean, the Chinese military philosopher Sun Tzu talked about it. The sort of father of modern strategy, if you like, uh, Karl von Clausewitz, talked about it um, in his seminal book on war. And it was perhaps most famously and visibly exploited as a concept by the German army during their lightning drive across Europe at the start of the Second World War. So to give you an example of sort of how maneuver warfare works, um, let's think about the first Gulf War, 1990-1991. Iraq has invaded Kuwait. The US has led an international coalition of forces that are intending to evict the Iraqi president from Kuwait. And initially an air campaign starts that lasts for six weeks. And then there's a hundred hour ground war. There's a maritime component as well. And Saddam Hussein's control of Kuwait ends. Now, one of the things that General Woman Schwarzkopf was head of central command, part of the US army or the US armed forces rather, tasked with managing that war, and Schwarzkopf staff did, was they identified these centers of gravity, these weak points in the Iraqi military. What do we need to hear? What do we need to accept in order to degrade the Iraqis' ability and will to continue fighting? And one of those was the Iraqi air defense system. Iraq has some of the most heavily defended airspace in the world. And Schwarzkopf and his air planners realized if we can degrade that air defense system to the point of it being useless, we control the skies. And if you control the skies, it's a really good way of helping you also control the ground. And so essentially, to go back to your original question, maneuver warfare is the, 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 the degradation of the enemy's will fight through the identification of weak points, centers of gravity, um, where the degradation or destruction of those centers of gravity prevent the adversary from continuing their course of action. Very long-winded description, <laughs> I know, but um, that's sort of how I see it. But so the upshot is that in contrast with World War One, where both sides just poured material and manpower into this bloody slugfest and basically just ground each other down into hamburger, with the Gulf War, you had one side which had a much clearer operational picture of the environment, knew where the enemy was, had the means to attack the enemy in a one-sided way. The, the, the Air Force had just rolled out this F-117 stealth fighter that could penetrate air, it was top secret. And so basically the Iraqis just got hammered and couldn't see what was coming. And it was a very one-sided, very quick and almost bloodless battle from the ally side. And, the, and, and Saddam was basically destroyed. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I, would, I would say, to sort of expand on the point you made, I, I would say rather than Saddam being destroyed, because as we know, he, he did live to fight another day after that. But the key thing was that the war aims, which was the liberation of Kuwait, were, were mm. also very clearly defined, which mm. I think was another thing that helped the maneuver battle or the maneuver mindset. You know, you have a set of 
objective you wish to achieve that are very clear. And then it's arguably easier to build the war plan around that. Now, at the time of the war, in the aftermath, some U.S. generals cited the influence of one American strategic thinker in particular at the time. This was a man named John Boyd. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about him, his background, what his his ideas were. John Boyd is a really interesting figure. I'm really pleased you brought him up, actually, because, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fan of his, as I think as, as, as a lot of people are. And, and John Boyd had been a fighter pilot in the Korean War. Um, and the Korean War is, is often referred to as the Forgotten War. Um, obviously, it happens quite soon after the Second World War. It's happening in the Far East on the Korean Peninsula. Um, but it features some very important innovations, and, and one of which is the sort of en masse use, if you like, of jet fighter combat. So we've seen the advent of, of jet and aircraft in the Second World War, but it's been quite small. It's been quite restrictive. Uh, in the Korean War, we see that changing. There is a significant deployment of fighter aircraft. And one of the things that Boyd noticed as a colonel in the US Air Force at that point, is that the pilot who um, observes the situation, decides what they're gonna do, and enacts that decision at a faster pace than the adversary in an air engagement is usually the one who will prevail in that um, engagement. And he came up with this concept called the OODA loop, um, which is observe, orientate, decide, and act. Um, and and he really, if you like, he's the, one of the modern uh, exponents of maneuver warfare. And his success is also, I think, underscored by the fact that the OODA loop, we, we still use it, we still refer to it. Um, any good theory is one that stands the test of time. Uh, and not only is it applicable in the military environment, but it's applicable across aspects of life in many ways. Um, businesses have taken up OODA loop. They're very interested in it, large organizations. Yeah, I think an important thing to understand about the OODA loop idea is that um, you, you are using it even when you don't realize it. It's actually a kind of a way of conceptualizing what the decision and action process is. And I just want to kind of quickly like explicate a little bit about the four parts, the OODA. Um, there's observe is the first O, which means basically to take in information about the environment, understand what's happening, form a picture of what's going on. In the case of the fighter uh, combat, you where is your enemy? How many enemies are there? What kind of aircraft are they flying? Do they have like a lot of weapons? Do they not have weapons? And what about you? What kind of plane are you flying? What's your altitude and speed and all this? So you form a kind of picture of what's happening. And then orient is to, it's sort of kind of related to that, I think, um, but you basically form um, an understanding of what the consequences are of your actions and what your different possibilities are. Then decide, you have to choose amongst those options. You have to figure out which one is best. And then to act is to implement that decision and to take action. And so if you're a fighter pilot, you, you think about where am I in relation to my enemy? Um, and what what is his position? And then you decide what you need to do. Maybe I need to pull up and, and bank, get behind him on his tail. I decide what to do. Should I fire a rocket or a, shoot my gun? And then I pull the trigger and I shoot at him. And this is, it's important to understand that this is not a sequential thing. All of these things are happening simultaneously all the time. But it's a loop in the sense that it's iterative. It's continuously ongoing. And as you say, this is this is something we use all the time in our daily life. It applies in business. Um, and it's been very influential. This kind of thinking, whether it's under the, the label of UDA or not, this it's also called the decision cycle. Um, you know, if, if you're in software development, there's a there's a process called agile software development, which is basically constantly iterating, constantly refining and um, trying to, in what you know, if in the case of a fighter pilot, you're trying to stay what's called inside the loop of your enemy, which means deciding more quickly, thinking more clearly. And I think this is a really crucial part of this idea, 
understanding your enemies or your adversaries mindset. How do they see the world? And so th this is what makes it so interesting is that I'm trying to understand what you know about me. Yeah. And that's, and then that can get very, very complicated if you have two like spy agencies. Um, and then and I think a spy agency, you know, Putin is a KG, former KGB officer and you know, the whole idea of, of intelligence, espionage, is to try to see what can I do without having to call in the bombers and the tanks, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And and something I'd add to that, Jeff, is also the the sometimes you you leave out actually the oriented part of the mm. OODA loop. You know, you just go from observe, decide, act. And that can just right. be instinct. You know, that can just right. be the, the speed of reaction has got so good that actually you're, you're not even thinking it because you, 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 you have calculated in your own mind that that course of action has a very, very high degree of probability that it will work. Uh, ergo, you don't necessarily need to do that orientation step. Um, to give you, give you an example, um, you know, ages ago we were, we, were, we were driving in the car and we parked up. And uh, my other half was driving and we were on a slope and they thought they'd put the handbrake on, but hadn't. And, and there was just a, a, just a, a, a very slight discernible movement of the car. And they just grabbed the mm. handbrake instantly and pulled it. You know, they didn't need to think about it. It was just immediate. And, and so that's, a, that's an, a, a, another interesting part of it. Um, and I think the point you mentioned about that the speed that you're going around the loop is really interesting because the goal, of course, is for you to get around the huge loop quicker than your adversary. That's, that's the key thing. And we, we can, I mean, we can come on to this in the moment, but if you look at what the U.S. Department of Defense is thinking now about multi-domain operations, that is all focused largely on getting around that OODA loop quicker than a Russia or a China or an Iran or whoever the adversary may do if uh, war breaks out at the end of the day. So in the context of the Gulf War, which we talked about earlier, observe would be using satellites, using stealth spy planes to look at where the Iraqis were. Now, this ha the battlefield happened to be a desert. There was no trees covering things up. They were sitting out in the open. And so the, uh, the allies knew exactly where every single tank and soldier was. And they were able to, having studied Saddam, they were able to predict like what his disposition was, what his intentions were, what his strategic goals were, and they were able to sort of game out and think about what are the different what are the different things that we can do and 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 what if we for instance faint like pretend like we're going to do an invasion through the sea but then we actually don't that's a kind of a classic maneuver warfare kind of thing right to to deceive your enemy in fact in your article you talk about movement tempo uh dislocation, disruption, and deception. So much of this idea of maneuver warfare is faking out your opponent. If you get inside his decision loop, you are able to understand what he knows and what he will conclude from that knowledge before he knows it, before he makes his own conclusions. So you can essentially run circles around him. And one of the really kind of scary and interesting things about the idea of the OODA loop is that if you are inside someone's OODA loop, they won't know what's happening and they might observe things happening and not have any understanding of why they will be baffled. And I think I take from this personally a broader lesson, which is if you are baffled and have no idea what's going on, you should think about your OODA loop and who might be inside it potentially. And I think this is particularly relevant in MA370. And really the main reason I wanted to talk about this whole concept is because with MH370, we find ourselves baffled. We are yeah. unable to explain this extremely strange set of evidence that we have. And the thing I've been trying to urge for over a decade now is let's think about our OODA loop because we are an accident investigator is actually carrying out an OODA loop, looking at the evidence, looking at the pieces of the airplane, if they are available trying to form a, a, trying to test out different theories. This is the orientation part. 
and then deciding what was the cause of the accident and then taking action, changing the rules, maybe mandating certain equipment or something. Um, and so with MH370, we are stuck in a dysfunctional OODA loop. And either we just don't have the analytical tools to understand this, this, this thing that happened, or potentially somebody is inside our, our OODA loop and is engaging in these things of dislocation, disruption, and deception. Um, one thing I would add to that, um, it's, it's very interesting uh, application of the OODA loop um, re regarding the loss of that airliner. And, and it got me thinking what you were saying just now, that when you went back and, you know, you go back and you look at the first Gulf War, um, one of the things that the coalition was lucky with was that it, in many ways it was quite an information heavy environment from the coalition's point of view. Iraq had just come out of a devastating war with Iran. So if I was, if I was the Iraqi military, what lessons have I learned from the Iran-Iraq war? Now you'd set that against the fact that Iraq was a totalitarian regime. Is it necessarily wise to learn lessons if you're a senior military commander? You might not want to put your head too far above the parapet and say, well, sir, well, Mr. President, I think, I think we got this wrong. I think we should have done mm. this better. You know, you might find yourself in quite a lot of trouble, to say the least. So you can start thinking, as you just mentioned, thinking like your adversary. You know, if you're an allied co a coalition commander, OK, I may, for the purpose of this, I am a senior Iraqi um, brigade commander. Um, I've had my experience fighting the Iranians. What what lessons have I learned from this? Which ones am I going to keep to myself and which ones am I going to share um, with the hierarchy, which lessons are going to be listened to by the hierarchy. Um, so you've got the, the mindset that you're getting into on top of all of the intelligence you're collecting from those other means that, that you mentioned about satellite intelligence, photo reconnaissance, human intelligence, um, even probably things like interviewing academics who are specialists in Iraqi society, you know, trying to get an idea of how Iraqi civil society interacts with the military, th things like that. You've got a large amount of information. What's very interesting with MH370 is the OODA loop starts to become complex when you have a paucity of information and it becomes harder to navigate your way around it because your, 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 the quality of your decision making is informed by the information at your disposal. That ability to orientate is informed by your inputs. And if you've got very few inputs, you're going to have very few outputs. And you know, one of the frustrating things with the MH370 loss is that um, one of the things I've said to people is that the, the, the sad fact is, and it's an awful reality for those who've lost family members and friends and things, is you know, that we have to consider the fact we may never know. Um, and that's deeply frustrating because it, it, it flies against how we behave as humans. You know, we need to have an answer to things. We, we, we go around our OODA loop and we get very frustrated if we can't get to the DNA part. You know, we can observe an orientate, but we can't decide an act because we don't have the inputs necessary to do that. And um, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. You know, that's a really great point. The OODA loop is implicitly a strategy for taking action. It's, it's a strategy for turning desire into a result. And it's not really about sitting and mulling things over and kind of cavelling and kvetching and just wishing things were different. It's about taking action. And if you can't take action, you're right, it's deeply frustrating. And I think our brains are sort of, the, again, this isn't an idea that Boyd invented. It's, a, it's a, just a reality that he articulated and our brains are designed to work like this. We're constantly taking in information, making assessments, forming theories, and taking action. Um, and so when we can't do what we're wired to do, it is it, it, we experience it as discomfort, and it's frustrating. I mean, personally, I think the, the reason that I think the OODA loop is so interesting in MH370 is that the authorities who, are, who have been managing the search, although they've pretty much given up, they had a model, a mental model of the situation 
that did that they took action on and didn't produce the results they expected and they just kind of stopped they weren't able to part of the OODA loop is this iterative process of forming ideas theories testing them trying them out and if they don't work modifying them and the, and the authorities have been unable to modify it and part of their model is that they have no adversary they think that there is no adversary and this I, again, this idea that if someone is inside your OODA loop, you are unable, you are kind of crippled in a sense because you you don't know why you're confused, and because your enemy is smarter and faster than you, you're unable to gain purchase. Anytime your fingers start to grope towards something that you can grab onto, th that that thing can be like ushered away. And I don't think it's unsolvable, which is why I'm having this podcast, but I think it does require a kind of more sophisticated understanding of the situation. Let me ask you kind of imponderable. What do you do as somebody who is struggling to achieve an objective if you, if you are flummoxed, if you're helpless, if you can't gain purchase, if someone is kind of constantly moving the ball on you, how do you get out of that? If you're, if, for instance, if you're a, if you're a fighter pilot and, and somebody's inside your OODA loop, how do you get out? That's a very good question. Um, I suppose cynically one could say, well, you, you, you should never have let yourself get into that situation in the first place, but that that's a glib response, you know, and that's, that's just not yeah, reality. Too late. It's very hard to know. I mean, it, and, and I'm, I can't claim I know the answer to that. I mean, I think that the thing, I suppose when things are going wrong, one of the immediate things is that you are suddenly reactive. So your adversary is getting around the OODA loop quicker than you are. And what that means is that you're always playing catch up. You're never, ever setting the initiative from that point. And in many ways, things are just going to get worse. Um, so maybe that's the moment where you have to rethink completely and think, right, I need to, do, I just need to do something completely different here. I need to do the unexpected thing. I need to do the expected thing with a twist. I need to, um, I need to smash this paradigm in a sense, you know, it's an awful cliche to say that, but I need to, I, I, I need to sort of, um, if, if you think, I mean, I, I think there'd, there'd be an example here that you, you could use from the, military operations that we saw in Afghanistan and, and Iraq in the wake of 9-11. Um, and I remember a conversation I had with a friend of mine. We were talking about maneuver warfare, actually. And they, they said to me, well, maneuver warfare is a very tech heavy. It's a very tech heavy, very, very developed nation thing to kind of pursue. And I disputed this a bit because I don't think maneuver warfare is necessarily tech based. I think it's a mindset. Um, and, and to give an example of the insurgency in Iraq or the insurgency in Afghanistan, I mean, again, I'm, I'm probably being a bit simplistic here, but if you think about when you had the, the initial large scale deployment of coalition troops into Afghanistan, you're dealing with the Taliban, uh, Al Qaeda and their various acolytes. And they would have learned pretty quick. Oh, and of course, the Northern Alliance, who were the local troops who were sympathetic to the coalition. Those adversaries would have learned pretty quick. There's not really a point, a point for, for any of us to go into a toe-to-toe -to -toe battle with the United States and its coalition. You know, toe-to-toe, -to -toe, it's not going to work. We're going to get absolutely smashed. Um, so what you do is you have to rethink that completely. And the upshot of that is you go to guerrilla warfare. Yes, we can't win a tank on tank engagement against an Abrams, but what we can do is, you know, cynically, we can blow up troops here and there. We can create a drip, drip, drip of casualties. We can match that with what we know about Western or the, the aversion to military casualties in large parts of Western policies, particularly in democracies. And we can exploit that. And we might not necessarily, it might not be immediate, but um, we, we might get as a result. And of course, it did get a result in Afghanistan with the eventual coalition withdrawal. And that, I think, is an example of, OK, we smashed the paradigm here. You know, we, we can't get round, we can't get round the UDA loop quicker than the Americans can. It's not going to happen. We're always going to be on the defensive if we're fighting on their terms. We need to start fighting on our terms. And I think that's maybe one of the ways you resolve that question you said about what if I'm just on the defensive? This isn't working out for me. I can't get round the UDA loop quicker 
than the adversary. That's a really fascinating point. You know, thinking about it, I think your friend had it absolutely backwards. In fact, historically, the context in which Boyd developed his ideas was one in which the U.S. had just emerged from this quagmire in Vietnam where they had tried to kind of slug it out. And he was really appalled by the degree, there's this sheer waste of just this, you know, mass um, kinetic warfare of just throwing troops into, into battle. And so he was... And then one of the really, uh, I think, formative events of that war, there was a particular uh, incident where the U.S. sent in um, some bombers and a fighter cover. And these were the latest generation of American jets. And they got absolutely chewed up by these MiG-17s, which were a generation older, you know, smaller, slower, less heavily armed, le much less technology. But they got absolutely chewed up because these older jets were lighter, nimbler, and they and the pilots could really focus on the mission, which was shooting down the Americans, at which they were very successful. And yeah, I mean, actually, sure, if you're two peer-to-peer -peer adversaries who are kind of fighting the same game, having more technology is definitely going to help you get inside your opponent's OODA loop. But if you're really unequal, then this kind of maneuver warfare mentality can help the underdog take on a better equipped adversary and i think a great and actually this leads me to another topic i wanted to get into with you which is maneuver warfare in the in the context of russia versus the west russia versus ukraine um and something that we've looked at a fair bit in this podcast and we'll be actually addressing in more detail in the next episode has to do with Russia's strategic perspective, Russia's strategic goals, and how it used maneuver warfare in the in the decades following Putin's ascent to power. We've touched on it in this conversation, but I think it deserves underlining. The OODA loop, actually, there's a fifth part that isn't one of the four letters, but it is implicit in, in talking about the OODA loop, is a goal. You have to have an objective that the OODA loop is bringing you towards. And understanding your opponent's objective is a really important part of getting inside his OODA loop. And Russia, um, I think, had an objective that wasn't really fully understood by a lot of American and Western strategic planners, which is namely this kind of revival of Russian imperial greatness and this, this taking its place amongst the great powers of the world after having been completely humiliated by the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War. So I was hoping maybe you could talk about how maneuver warfare has has been relevant to the, 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 the way that Russia has carried itself since, well, especially since Georgia. Sure, yeah. I, I mean, the Russian Russian military thinking places a huge amount of stress on, on maneuver warfare. Um, in the 1950s, um, in the wake of the, the Second World War, and also before the war after the um, Russian Revolution, in Russian in military circles, there was a lot of thinking about maneuver warfare, and there was a extensive writing about it. In fact, some of the best writing on, on this aspect of conflict comes from Russian military thinkers. Um, and if you go and look in the Russian military doctrines now and, and you read accounts of how Russia thinks about war, particularly in the land environment, the maneuver mindset is very definitely embedded in that thinking. But one of the big problems I think Russia's had is that on one hand, there is this embrace of the concept, um, but that is set against the prevailing governmental and political realities of what Russia's faced really since the Russian Revolution, I would argue. So you're dealing with, in the years of communism, a autarkic, uh, you know, authoritarian, totalitarian regime. In the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, you're then dealing with a sort of chaotic um, governmental structure, if you like, that then eventually gives way to Mr. Putin, who becomes increasingly authoritarian. One of the things I think in the Western case is that maneuver warfare is, is, is quite applicable, if you like, to democratic nations because it, in, it encourages a 
um, how, how do I put this diplomatically, but it, it, it encourages initiative effectively. It encourages the commander, wherever they are, to take the decision that they need in order to achieve mission success. And creativity is a very important part of it. Uh, initiative is very important. I think the Russian military completely get that. Uh, but I think they're stymied by how their command structure works and how their ultimately their politico-military command structure works as well. That while you may have individual initiative, and we've certainly seen that in Ukraine, and Ukrainians I speak to regularly will say it's a misnomer to think Russians are always hidebound on doctrine. They take doctrine very seriously, but they also do have uh, initiative and they show that and that's demonstrated. But that has to be said against the next echelon up, if you like, and the, w the willingness of the commander to say to the subordinate, yes, go ahead, please be creative, show some initiative, do something, you know, I don't care how you get the objective, go and get the objective. That's the crucial thing. And that's a very maneuverous mindset, I would argue. So I think in answer to your question, you know, to summarize, you, 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 to take a broad brush sort of picture of Russian military history since the revolution, you've had this antagonism between a maneuverous mindset uh, particularly after the Second World War, and the politico-military realities of how the Russian military is run effectively. And I don't see that resolving anytime soon. Um, and, and that, in many ways, has caused Russia problems. It's caused Russia problems in Chechnya, in Syria, in Georgia. It's now causing problems in Ukraine. There is a disconnect. Um, now, if Russia can fix the disconnect, then things might be very different. But part of fixing that disconnect may be for Russia to finally, you know, embrace a democratic, open, liberal government that will encourage, you know, will act as a foundation to encourage that. You could then extrapolate further and say, but if it, Russia embraces those concepts, will will it will the country or will the country's government rather and its rulers still have an aggressive, such an aggressive mindset towards its near abroad? Um, in many ways, that's another conversation. But I think that, to me, is where the, the, the problem sort of lies. So we were talking about the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, and how it seemed uh, to the rest of the world uh, was, I think, shocking to a certain extent. I think Russia in particular, which was sort of at its nadir at that point in the early 90s, having just come out of this, basically the Soviet Union had collapsed. And they, when the Russian armed forces were just a mess. Let's put it that way. But as when Putin came to power and he was determined to revive Russian greatness, um, one of the things he did was invest a lot of money and attention into reviving electronic warfare, looking at intelligence gathering. Um, the Russians have come out with a whole bunch of specialized vehicles. This is, this is your area of expertise, so I'd love to hear your perspective on this. But the other thing that we saw happening was an investment in, you know, what's called gray zone techniques like assassination, disinformation, hacking, and election interference. What I like to call skullduggery, <laughs> you know. And 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 Putin is a KGB guy, so he this is kind of natural. He's a judo champion, or champion. He was a judo black belt or something. So this idea of kind of assessing your rival and kind of using their own momentum against them is kind of second nature. And so we saw yeah. a lot of this in, so if we're talking about the era around 2014, we're seeing all kinds of actions along this line. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And, and I mean, you mentioned the, the electronic warfare aspect of, of the Russian military. I mean, fighting in the electromagnetic spectrum is something that, the Russian military writ large take extremely seriously, as does NATO, to, to be fair as well. Um, but it, it sees it seriously in the wider context of information operations. I mean, Russian military thinking, um, there's a number of really good books on this as, as well that are out there, um, talks about information as a resource and information as a target set. Uh, and something that can be exploited. Now, in the Cold War, we would have called it propaganda. Um, you could argue that, to an extent, information warfare is is a is a sophisticated propaganda exercise in, in a sense. But you're absolutely right in in terms of you know what you're saying in your question that what you're seeking to do is target. It's a maneuverous mindset again, an asymmetric mindset as well. 
you know, all warfare is essentially effect based. So you you drop a shell on something to have an effect. You blow something up to have an effect. You jam a radio to have an effect. And and what Russia is doing in the information uh, arena and in the information world, if you like, is very similar. The targeting through cyberspace, for instance, social media, whatever it is, is being done for an effect. So it's a, you could argue it's a very sort of maneuvered way of looking at things. And as you say, Mr. Putin has been in the world of espionage for a long time. I mean, he, he is an old hand at it. I've taken up so much of your time and I really appreciate your generosity with your time and your expertise. I will love to come back and talk to you more. This is an almost bottomless well. But just to put a pin in it for today, we've been talking about the OODA loop, the decision cycle, why you can feel really baffled if someone gets inside your decision cycle and what you can do to get out of it. I really recommend people check out your article. I'll provide a link uh, here, Maneuver Warfare and the electro Electromagnetic Spectrum um, for the Rusi Journal. Um, Tom, thank you so much. Not at all, Jeff. It's been an absolute pleasure. As you say, I mean, you know, you you and I could sit down with beers and talk about this all night because there's there's so many different directions. And um, you, thank you uh, massively for the for the article as well. Um, I would I would advise people it also it's really well as an insomnia cure um, if that's something that they're looking for. Um, but let's you know more than happy to keep the conversation going. Let's do that. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be chatting to you. And let's catch up again soon. I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks again to Tom Withington for coming on the show. Uh, always incredibly interesting to hear what he has to say. Um, now I'd like to move on to a community radar segment. I want to touch on last week's episode. We talked about UFOs, wormholes, and the whole concept of conspiracy theories and how those conspiracy theories can really muddy the waters and make it harder for us to understand what happened to MH370. Got a lot of feedback from people. People had strong feelings one way or the other, but I want to go to another old friend of the podcast, Ed Denzel, who, who wrote an email that I thought was just really hit the nail on the head. He wrote, Jeff, listening to this week's episode right now, always dangerous and frustrating when straying into the worlds of people like Ashton Forbes. My perception of all conspiracy theorists like 9-11 and Flight 370, etc., I don't think they believe anything they say. As your guest said, they are all opportunists. And the more they get attention, the more they lean into their non-believed beliefs. Really, they're provocateurs. They have no real ideas or values. They simply appear to think anything or support anything that is controversial. I have a friend who is like this. He's a nice guy, but he has no real solid ideas about anything once you peel it all away. He will simply take a contrary position just to have a conversation slash argument with people. This is who Ashton Forbes, et cetera, are. Another thing, they are master manipulators, and that includes YouTube views. I believe that's all faked. Easy to. Hmm. Interesting. I always like to hear what Ed Denzel has to say. He's helped me a lot, given me good advice for the podcast. You should definitely check out Ed's excellent podcast, Unfound, at theunfoundpodcast.com. Um, one last thing before I go, I just want to touch briefly on the Flapron project, uh, which uh, I started talking about a few episodes ago. It got a huge response, and I'm going to be getting back to it heavily in the episode after the next one, getting into practical steps that we can take as a community to try to move the ball forward and get some resolution to this mystery. For now, I just want to quickly describe an idea that Andy Sabrandi came up with after we spoke for that podcast interview. And this is that in addition to putting a flapper on or maybe other drifters into the water at the seventh arc, we could try collecting lepus barnacles off of global drifters that have already been at sea for a while. Remember, there are thousands of these, these things floating around all the time, uh, and they've all been steadily accumulating marine life during their journey. And so by intercepting them, collecting them, taking specimens from many of them, we could start to get a robust picture of, of what we should expect to see on pieces of debris as they spend time floating through the ocean. And of course, compare that to what we saw on the actual pieces of MH370 debris. Okay, but how do you get these drifters? They're out in the middle of the ocean, they're in the middle of nowhere, and they're often far from shipping routes and everything. But the first thing, the first thought that I had would be to try to somehow enlist 
the help of ships or boats or yachts that are out at sea and may, might be nearby uh, and, and ask them to collect some for us. Uh, but as I was pondering this idea, Andy Sabrandi reached out to me and he told me that he had an idea and he told me that he had the data for a drifter that his company had made and he was still collecting these position updates on. It had been, it had run aground on the eastern coast of Madagascar and the data showed that it had gotten picked up, carried by road across to the other side of the island and was at that moment sitting on the shore of Madagascar. Well, I looked up on Google Earth and lo and behold, it's sitting right next to a fisheries institute, an organization that studies fisheries. And I got very excited. I tried to call them up. I had trouble getting through. Um, I reached out to a Madagascar journalist who helped me. He made some inquiries and managed to connect to the director of this institute. Unfortunately, uh, this story does not have a happy ending. Um, he had no idea what I was talking about. And he got rather offended when I suggested that he had this thing, which he said he didn't have. And he, I think he thought I was calling him a liar or something. He got mad at me. Um, or at least the email was a little frosty, let's say. So, so far that has been a bust, um, but it, I feel opened up an intriguing possibility, which is that we can, we can use drifter data to find buoys that have washed ashore and then try to get people who are nearby to go collect them, take the shells and give us the data. Um, so as I said, more of that to come. Um, the next episode is going to be about more strategic considerations. Don't want to give away too much right now, but the episode after next, we're going to start getting heavily into drifters, flaperons, data, and what we can do to solve this mystery. Finally, once again, I just want to remind you that I'm now posting special content for paid subscribers on the Substack. That is alongside and in addition to the regular content that I do every week, aka what you're watching right now. Um, but if you click through the tab above uh, here right now, you can go to Substack and sign up for a paid subscription. That really helps tremendously. And if you can't afford that, totally understand it and get that. It also really helps if you just go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel or to the Substack show page. Anyway, that's it for now. Thanks for watching. Once again, my closing words, don't stop looking and don't stop asking hard questions. See you next time.